Welcome to Classical, Classical Rebellion. Rebellion. Delta variations. Delta variations. Variation Colon. two. Yeah. <laughs> Colon. Colon. What do you want to call this one? The Golden Horseshoe. We're going to talk a little Met history tonight. Um, this is a book, a lovely uh, illustrated history of the early Metropolitan Opera, the, the first house that was uh, lost to the wrecking ball in 1966. Um, went through several phases. And I had this book. It's an absolutely amazing book. It was published really as a, uh, as a nostalgic memento of the house, but also, I think, as a justification for the new house to, to explain to the people who, who cherish this house uh, the necessity of, of the move. And, mm -hmm. and, and okay. I learned a number of things, which, I never, which are, are pretty amazing, um, that I sort of take for granted. But I think a lot of us do when we look back at this. You know, the, the acoustic history of this theater of this auditorium is um, well documented. I okay. mean, there's from 1930 till today, there have been broadcast, I mean, all through the, from Christmas Day of 1931 with Hansel and Gretel, right through to uh, the, in, to, you know, 15 years ago, there were Saturday morning opera broadcasts sponsored by Texaco, right. and, or 20 years ago. But the, I mean, that's a long time. That's a lot of broadcasts. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the singing and the performing from, that, from, uh, from those eras are amply documented and, and what they sounded like in this house. It's, it's pretty amazing. This was one of the best acoustics in opera. Hmm. But it's all interior. It was all interior. It was an, uh, an irregularly shaped lot. The, um, there was no room for expansion whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, not like Covent Garden, you know, where they could, they could um, uh, knock down everything except the, the, the stage, uh, uh, the, the, the auditorium itself, and then build back even bigger and incorporate extra areas and loggias outside and new, you know, tons of public space. You couldn't do that here. It was impossible. Okay. The scenery leaned up against the unused scenery. You know, leaned up against the back of the theater. Right. It was um, because the guys who designed the house had never designed an opera house. They had never before, and they did a wonderful job on the on on the auditorium. But mm -hmm. they knew nothing about the necessity of wing space. Oh, right. And That's so they 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 got handed this parcel of land and said, "Design a house." So they did, but. Anyway, I mean, right from the get-go, it was known that this was inadequate. Uh -huh. And um, as early as 1908, um, Gatti uh, Casazza was promised, and they, they were talking about a new house. They even built one, the new theater at 62nd and West Central, West Central Park. Okay. It, and it was only there for about four years before it went bankrupt and they redeveloped it as apartments. Okay. It was, it, it was, they, they made it for operetta and for musical theater. Uh -huh. And it, then they, in, to be an intimate theater, so they put 2,500 seats in it. And it became a giant opera house. And it was too big to be intimate and, and too wet for the voices to be understood. And it had all the space in the world and all the public space. And it was a gorgeous theater and completely useless. Huh. So it went, they, it went bankrupt and they sold it. And wow. It, so... The, the need of a new house was, was, was there from 1908. That was part of Gotti's thing, you know. And if a war, two world wars and a depression hadn't intervened, it would have happened sooner. I see. Okay. There's no doubt of it. So, hmm. I mean... Interesting. There's that. Right. Um, there's the fact that it had two decorations before we arrive at this because they built it to be fireproof and then they filled it with wood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wood paneling and it burned up. You know, so then in, that was about the mid 1890s, and then they they redid it in in uh, with lovely cream and white, and then at, in about 1908, after 10 years, they saw uh, when Gotti came in, they thought, well, actually burnished gold would be more dignified, so they redid it with the the face that everybody with the gold curtain and everything. Okay, and that became the face of what you know they carried the gold over into the new house. Yes. Well, but did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? That the the after the re, the the fire um, it, from from the mid 1890s on, the orchestra pit of the Metropolitan Opera was hydraulic. 
it was lowerable for large orchestras, and, and they could raise it up for smaller Mo Mozart operas to bring the uh, the, the, the orchestra okay. the smaller right. orchestra closer uh, to the to the house. Sure. I, I never knew that. Yeah, that's I didn't, interesting. That is that's a degree of flexibility I never knew that house had. Right. Um, and another thing that, that I think is really striking about how this company operated is that do you realize that the Metropolitan was not a self-producing organization until 1935. Okay. They always you, you had the Metropolitan, first of all, it was the Metropolitan Real Estate, Metropolitan Opera Real Estate, Opera House Real Estate Company. And th that was the, the box holders and everybody, they funded this company and okay. they built the theater. And then they hired Abbey and Ground Management to produce all their operas. They booked the singers, they booked the designers, they provide the sets, they right. did all of this. And, and so that didn't really work. They, they eventually went through a bunch of management. Right. But they didn't actually so combine the board with the with production until Edward Johnson came in, hmm. and that that was that's when, I mean, I think most people think of when they think of the Metropolitan Opera and Caruso and all everybody who was you know going back then, uh, all the huge stars uh, that they would be under a single organization, but it wasn't. Right. And if they didn't produce well, then they could just be fired, you know, yeah. and they hire somebody else. Yeah, and there was no season. That's the other thing. I just, I just was listening to Jerome Hines and Franco Corelli on a, a YouTube interview with Stefan Zucker, Stephen Zucker. Yeah, the, uh, the world's yes. highest tenor. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard him sing. He's got, he's got a, uh, a voice that didn't change. It sounds like to me. So he just always talks like this. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's something yeah. Joseph Schmidt. Yeah. He talked like this up here so, all the time. So did, you know? you, so did Dr. Johannes Brahms. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Anyway, so but the guy knows his stuff. So Jerome Hines was saying how they didn't know 10 days before sometimes what show they were going to do. There was no season. There was no five, five years scheduled out. You're right. No, no. What there was was, hey, there's this great soprano that's coming up. We can get her these dates. What's an opera she would sound good in? Mm -hmm. And then they would program the opera based on the availability. The singer. Yes. Imagine that. Imagine well, the singer being preeminent. We had a very interesting. We have a very had a very interesting luncheon. We did with the librarian of the Metropolitan Opera former. House, who, former who who just retired after thirty years, mm -hmm. um, Bob Sutherland. Yes. Hi, Bob. It was a great lunch. We really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, hope that we get to talk to him again. Yep. Um, and I rather boldly said to him, you know, um, I, I absolutely adore the Metropolitan Opera. You know, I, 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 I revere it. I don't love that new house. I just don't. It's it. it uh, and he's he's like, oh, I like it. It's got I a, like it. It's got a sweet spot. I don't. I don't like it. I don't You're like not its. To. I don't like its ethos. I don't like its its size. It's it's a thousand seat bigger seats bigger than even the the old house, and that amount of distance just makes a difference to me. I mean, it's just well, vast. don't sit that far away, John. What you know? Spend some money, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to sit in family circle. Yeah. Well, uh, you're right. I could I could stand. <laughs> Actually, at the old Met. They used to have what they used to call the uh, the backdoor arrangement and um, uh, the backdoor pass, which was that hangers-on and friends of the uh, of the of the of the artists or of the musicians, people who were you know they could they could come to the back door and they could just like walk in to the house uh, to whatever capacity it wasn't full, you know, just like wave them in, right, you know, like that. And when Bing came in, it's like. Into that, it's like no more of that. Yeah, because we got to sell every ticket. Yeah, um, because generally speaking, the Met was not profitable. You know, it, it always generally operated at a loss. And mm -hmm. like, Gothi Kazatsa was well aware like that every opera, arts organization that's ever existed. It's not designed, but sometimes they did make a profit. And and you know, it just you know, if you have big enough stars, and they very carefully controlled the ticket prices, and 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 didn't. Um, didn't raise them any more than they absolutely had to. Mm. You know, I mean, they could have, but they didn't. So sometimes they didn't make a profit when they might have. Anyway, um, the reason I and and be, is because 
when Bing came in, he placed, like prior to Rudolf Bing, who, who became the general director of the Metropolitan in 1948, and, and they, um, and he, he facilitated the move to the new. He facilitated. He, he oversaw the move. Got to it Lincoln done Center. to to Lincoln Center and uh, and over and demanded that the old house be demolished. I mean that was he saw to it that hmm. it was taken down because he didn't want a rival company getting it. New York City Opera. Right. And lo and behold, what happens? Where does New York City Opera wind up? Right across the plaza from him at Lincoln Center. Right. In the New York State Theater. Well, anyway. Um, I think it was a bonehead move myself. I don't think it was necessary to, to destroy that theater. However, um, prior to Bing, apart from David Belasco, who, who wrote the play uh, Madame Butterfly. Yeah. And, and, and Girl of the Golden West. And Girl of the Golden West, and, and, and directed both of his own plays in Puccini's operatic adaptations. Uh, no Broadway director had ever been hired at the Met. Okay. So it, it was literally, they would have two or three or maybe four staging rehearsals with the principals and they had a, there were no name directors. It was just staff directors. Right. And it was like a couple of guys, you know, nobody, no names. And it's just like, direct, okay. They're just you, directing traffic. You, you know, you know the, 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 the plots of these, you, you go set them up with in that opera and basically the singers would tell them where they wanted to be. Yeah. And, uh, and so after, after um, uh, Bing came in, you started getting people from Broadway, Tyrone Guthrie, people like that coming okay. in, and, 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 and drama became, acting became important, real rationalized acting, you know, and, and um, if you had a singer like Charlie Oppen or somebody who'd had exposure to, to Stanislavski or some of the others, you know, mm -hmm. from Europe who had, had, had worked with, with, the, um, with them, then great. Right. Uh, but if, if you didn't, you, you were just there, there to sing. And I still maintain that's preeminent. Well, this is why I don't like the new house, because it led to way overstaged, set heavy, um, mammothly uh, 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 visualistic productions like Zeffirelli's Bohème mm -hmm. that reduce the preeminence of the singing. It's not a movie. It's never going to be a movie. The singing comes first. If the singing is not there, you've got nothing in opera. Right. It doesn't matter how pretty the set is. It's a failure. Right. It doesn't hurt to have a pretty set, though. It doesn't hurt, but it's not strictly necessary. Now, I, no, realize, necessary. I realize that the depth of the stage at the old house was a problem. However, I learned this from this book. They had rear projection... Rear projection... Um, uh, scenery. Okay. Like we think that, that like in Great Scott, we had projections for the yeah. scenery, right? D digital projections. Well, mm -hmm. they had projection, projected scenery as early as the mid late 1920s. Okay. They, were, so, it, they didn't have it often, but it was a concept that had made right. its way to the Met. Uh, and, uh, you know, you could, they, you could, nowadays you could do so much more. You don't need a stage, the set, the size of the Met to do a lot more with it. The kind of digital projections we have, right. you can create well, that's, worlds. That's, that's for to kind of gently go off topic just a little bit. That's the where the production costs can be reaped, except you've got some unions in the way. Well, now there are unions. It's a different yeah. situation. However, if you had because if you have if you don't have to build sets, do you know how many hours you're cutting out of the stagehands union? Most of them. Well, there it is. Yeah, you and know. you don't have to. You don't have to move sets. But the no, the digital. That's where I think. Admit it. There's well, a massive opportunity for the opera industry. Oh, I, I think is so. Is to pay that one-time upfront I, cost to put the equipment in. I thought that idea was mine about about ten years ago. What? I thought I was all over that. Doing pro projecting scenery. I mean, you could project oh. Valhalla like crazy. You could do amazing things with it. Yeah. And I, I had that idea. I, did, I didn't say anything about it right. at the time, but I did have, but it wasn't even new. It was going in the 1920s. Yeah. yeah. Now, there's a Met production of Tannhäuser that has projected scenery. I'm yeah. all for it. Yeah. Because you can combine projected, if you're doing rear projection on a cyclorama, for instance, which is a curved 
a curved curtain that 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 reduces the um, uh, the obvious lines of the stage and and helps to sort of break the illusion of uh, you know uh, the four walled environment of the stage. Mm -hmm. um, if you can project onto that, I mean, you could they could do amazing things. Yeah. And you could combine that with with stage scenery and stuff. Having seen Zeffirelli's Bohem at the Met and having going to see it again on November 9th. Uh, it's more Pirates of the Caribbean than movie to me. <laughs> it's what it, it really looks. It seems more like that, like that scale, that amount of detail. Um, yeah, no, I agree. And, it's, and it's wonderful. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, and it, it, is it, strictly speaking, it, it necessary? No. And is it a substitute for the caliber of ensemble that had developed under Edward Johnson and continued into Rudolf Bing? No way it's not a, a substitute no, for that. Those singers just don't exist. Well, they don't. True, but they they might be more likely to if they were able to sing in a more manageable environment. I don't Maybe. know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to change. You'd have to pull them out of the academy. You know, Bob said Bob said the uh uh it has a lovely sweet spot down front. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Well, yeah, but the for old the house singers. the old house was one giant sweet spot. The whole thing was a, a sweet yeah. spot. Well, the old so, house isn't coming back, so we have to... No, but another theater design more like it could. Maybe. You know, and I, and I personally, I, I think that's probably where it's headed on, you know... Yeah. No, I've seen four productions at the Met. I have had no complaints whatsoever about the, the experience of theater. Right. Some of the casts have been useless, I guess. Hmm. Um, in that they just I just couldn't hear them. Right. But I wanted to be able to, from where I was sitting, I wanted to have been able to hear them in a 600 seat house. <laughs> you can't sit in row H and not hear the mezzo, and then blame it on the size of the house. True. True. That is the academy that is de that is designing these singers. And that's not good enough. And it's the impatience. This is one of those things that Jerome Hines said on that that YouTube video I watched. Or listen to. There's no. There's no visuals. Uh, he talked to Eduardo Mueller. Uh, Good old Eduardo Mueller. Yeah. Who uh, <laughs> I was. I don't know. I was in like at least ten opera productions that he conducted. But he asked. He said, Eduardo, why? Why aren't there big voices anymore? And he's asking this in the '80s, let alone now. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't. Ed Mueller said he didn't think conductors had the patience for those voices to come together. Because those big voices take more time to put together. They're somewhat clunky. They're a little bit, Do like you know, they have to be coordinated. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they have to have time to create the technique. Corelli and, didn't, go, didn't, didn't make his debut until he was 33. Yeah. yeah. 33. And, and here's another interesting thing that I learned from this uh, and that bears out that statement. The, the American tenor James McCracken, who was unfortunately short, but nevertheless had a voice of a lion and became a great Otello. Mm -hmm. uh, his first role with the company in about 1958 was something, something along the lines of the butler in Traviata who sings, La che oh, right. pronta. Yes. <laughs> his first role, but he was in the company. Right. And then he started to come along yeah. and they find that's, things that are, that are appropriate for you. And they, they do that with the Linderman Young Artist Program. Mm -hmm. They'll do that. Just get them yeah. in the company and then find out what they're yeah. best at. That was Stephanie Blythe's path. Right. But think of James McC I mean, if you go on, <laughs> yeah. go on, yeah. uh, uh, on and look I at... I wonder, that's got to be out there somewhere. There's an amazing recording video of James McCracken uh, singing um, Otello just before he died. And he'd had a stroke in about 88. And in, in 87, he's in Berlin. Hmm. And uh, he's going for it. Yeah. And... It sounds pretty amazing. There, I don't, I don't know who else out there right now is gonna, gonna bellow Otello like that. Right. And this is a guy who is about like, to judge by, he's about five six or five eight, mm -hmm. who can stand up uh, on on the stage with a, a baritone that's a head and a half taller than he is and dominate the guy vocally. Right. <laughs> yeah. So here's another interesting thing about the old Met that. Oh, and going through one of one of the joys of this book, I highly recommend anybody to read this book. It's fascinating. And nowadays, you can coordinate it with YouTube and look up 
I, I, I tried specific to recording. look up specific artists. You can also you can also look up specific you recordings. You can also subscribe through the Mets website to have access to the entire archive. Well, there is that. Yeah. There's so much already on you, but but on YouTube you can also. I may have to do that. Yeah. But the because I'm actually the, the archive right has more. I think it's like ten bucks a month. Well, I think it also has it, it, the archive would probably include more than just the broadcast. There's probably oh, yeah. their archival holdings. Right. But everything from the Mapleson cylinders, some of which are incredible. I mean, uh, as a document, Lillian Nordica singing uh, in Tristan and Isolde. Hmm. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to that recording, Nordica on the, on the, on the Mapleson cylinders in live performance. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, and that's a tough opera for me these days. But also, uh, I, 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 so I'd find a name that I'd never heard of. You know these Central European singers that came sure. to the came to the Met in the in the 1890s and stayed until 1910. Some of them, um, uh, and one of the, one recording um, which is prior to Kirsten Flagstadt, the Met had Frieda Leiter, um, and prior to Frieda Leiter, uh, they had in the 1920s they had uh, Nanny Larsen Todson. <laughs> okay. Now, I'd never heard of her, so I look her up, and there's a recording of her singing the Liebes Tote in, uh, um, in about 1926, mm -hmm. and this is the only recording of the Liebes Tote by, by, a, by a Wagner soprano cause, that I've ever heard that sounded like a lithe young girl impassioned. Damn, hmm. that's sexy singing. Right. I'm not kidding. Hmm. It's sexy. But beyond that, when she goes for the top note, it's all there. Right. And then there's also this incredible suppleness and, and girlishness to the voice underneath it. And then all of a sudden it just blossoms into these top notes. And it's like, I, I've, I've never heard I anybody else sing it like that. Hmm. Right, so check it out. Nanny to Larson Tudson, L-A-R-S-E-N-T-O-D-S-E-N. -S -E -E and okay. uh, an artist you've never heard of. Right. And, and then comes Frida Leiter, you know, and I was going to mention her in talking about Wagner voices. Right. Frida Leiter. There's not that much of her on YouTube. There's just a little bit. There's enough. You can yeah. hear the voice. It was incredible. And so she decided to go back to Europe. And just as she left, uh, on February 2nd of 1935, um, Kirsten Flagstaff makes her debut as Sieglinda. Mm. Two, four days later, the, and the critics all went, it was very nice. Four day, and she was on the point of retiring when Gatti hired her to come to New York. And uh, <laughs> and four days later, she sings Isolde. Wow. And yeah. within, within a month, she'd sung five Wagnerian roles. And mm -hmm. everybody at the Met just went, we, we found our Gigi. Right. You know? Yeah. And she stayed for 20 years. And, uh, I mean, well, she was gone during the war, mm -hmm. but, but she came back. And it was an incredible voice. But um, you, can, you can actually go back and hear that, that, that first performance in Valkyrie. Right. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, well, something big's happening here. Yeah. Now, the other thing that I just wanted to mention, television and opera. Television and opera, and I have always heard about the televised, um, the televised uh, opening night, the Don Carlo of 1950 was televised, and I've been always looking for video, looking for video. Certainly, some some kinescope must exist by 1950. Of of, of they must have filmed it of, of something of it. I've never been able to find anything. Um, and reading this book, I find out that the the opening nights of 1948, 49, and 50 were all televised. But the, they were televised on closed circuit television. You could subscribe to them in, in your city and go, it's like the Met in HD in the movie right. theaters. Yeah. And I thought that was a new idea because we've all been so familiar with Met broadcasts from Lincoln, mm -hmm. live from Lincoln Center. Right. Well, it's not new. Rudolf Bing had that idea that was brought to him and said, yeah, let's do it. But then after 1950, they decided that it would be better to wait until the new house. By that time, he knew they were going. Mm. 
mm -hmm. and it would be better to, to wait, and, and by that time, television broadcasting would be more, you know, right. and so they, they didn't do it after that, but I'll bet you somewhere that um, uh, there, there, there's, I bet you in the Met Archive somewhere there's some kinescope film mm. of, uh, of that opening night broadcast. But I think that's really an interesting forward-looking approach as well, because that gets back to the way television was viewed. What is it? Uh, Fahrsehen is the, the word for television in German or something very similar. Okay. And when, when it was brought in, in the 1930s, you went to a viewing parlor to watch right. communally. Yeah. It was like theater. And so you like you'd go to the bar to watch the game. So whoever ha had a similar idea to do this with the, um, but I'd be very interested to know what what cities it was broadcast to, mm -hmm. how far it was broadcast out, outside New York it, it, right. it reached. But uh, those would be some very exciting things to see. Mm -hmm. So things about that you didn't know about the old Metropolitan Opera House. Um, there is some film. There's very little uh, f f imagery of the, you know what what it, it looks so pretty. But the problem was that that's the interior. Outside of the interior, it was just blank white walls with staircases going every which way <laughs> to get you to the boxes. They didn't have an elevator until uh, about 1920. You know, you had to walk all the right. way up. Yeah. But so they installed two elevators that would get people up there, which is not a lot. But um, the, the the front of house areas were very cr were cramped. They they had they had built two rehearsal halls up on either side of the fly tower, on uh, on the back of the stage, mm -hmm. um, to try to get some additional rehearsal space. Right. Um, well, that was not uncommon to have a rehearsal hall on top of a theater in New York. There was uh, it was okay. They're up there. Right. But anyway. Um, yeah. I d I feel like the new Met is now old enough that it feels. Traditional. Like it has some gravitas. Oh, it like, definitely I does. I love the Sputnik chandeliers going up. I love the that's the staircase. It, I, 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 I just. I'm a fan. I invited you to go. You said no. <laughs> so I'm gonna go see Boem. I'm gonna skip Porgy and Bess because I'm just not that interested. I guess I don't know. And then Meister Singer is the real reason. The only reason oh, yeah, I'm going yeah, yeah. for, for Boam is because I would go I'm a, with you if I'm a I fan could. of the, the tenor who's singing. If I could go, I would. You could go. I can't go. I'm, I'm kind of, I have responsibilities here. Mm. But um, one of these days, one of these days we will. Yeah. And uh, so I'm a little trepidatious about Meister Singer. I mean, now. I've seen La Juive, Traviata, and, and, Part of Cozy, a uh, uh, second act of, of um, Figaro. No, Cozy. No, Figaro. Figaro. Second act of Figaro um, at, at, at the Met. So I've spent a little bit of time in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I saw Neil Shikoff uh, in, in La Juive along with uh, our base here. Ferruccio? Ferruccio Furlanetto. Um, and uh, I saw an A cast in Figaro with Levine in the pit. And it was great. It was all. It was all fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I just. I just don't have an emotional attachment to it. I would rather see them in a different kind of theater. Okay. Slightly different scale of theater, um, and and a, a different ethos. But, you know, that's certainly not to denigrate the accomplishments that that house has seen. I mean, well, I most certainly prefer it to the San Diego Civic Theater. <laughs> and, well, I prefer and maybe Dorothy Chandler. Well, Dorothy Chandler's not that great. It's okay. I've never heard anything good about Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. I've never heard Fine. anything good about it. It's dead yeah. as a doornail. And from what I mean, that, that's what everyone has always said to me who's ever been there. It's dead as a doornail. Well, Richard Leach sounded quite alive in Tosca when Did I he? when I heard him in the early two thousands. It was. It was awesome. I, I but like this the last acoustic. cast in Travatori. I like the acoustic of the Civic Theater in San Diego. I've been in a lot worse. Oh yeah, the a hell of a lot fine. worse. But, but but I I I just I like this that that size of a stage because it 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 pushes things forward towards the audience, and that's the virtue of the old style of of the style of the old house, and also its limitation. Mm-hmm. So I recognize that, right? But I think there's a happy median, 
I mean, I think that, uh, um, and you know, maybe I'll live to see it. Who knows? Probably not. But Probably not. Yeah, things don't tend to return. Well, you say that, but look right here in San Diego. In, in, in San Diego County, we have the Escondido Center for the Performing Arts, which is a horseshoe theater. Mm -hmm. We have the. Uh, uh, now, I've never been in the Poway Center for the Performing Arts. It's just a normal theater. Okay. Um, but the uh, there have been a number of um, the 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 new theater at Glyndebourne Horseshoe, because it gives a better acoustic than a square. I mean it um, for one thing. Okay. But um, those kinds of designs have sonic virtues that have have been rediscovered in the last twenty five years. Um, uh, in various places internationally. So I, I think, you know, when, when the time comes, let's put it this way, when the, whenever the, the, the time comes for that the Metropolitan Opera decides that maybe they need to downsize or that, that their time in that style has, has passed and they're going to opt for a different venue, uh, for an, another new house, mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. Um, I mean, I'll only be 108. Right. So, but, um, I'll bet you it looks more like the old house than than it does like like the present Metropolitan Opera. Yeah. Okay. That's my my what I would bet. Right. This cat dressed for the evening. You see. Yes. With the, the tuxedo. With the tuxedo effect here. We have a very properly attired operatic cat. Yes. Who's That's right. Now pinning her ears back. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, that's my um, my quick tour through the. Um, uh, um, yeah, I like that idea of going through this book and then listening to the. There's a lot of very good material out there from the ter from the turn of the century. Oh yeah, I just I mean, listened to a 1947 Il Trovatore. That's not turn of the century, but then mm. uh, with Mar Björling and Leonard Warren. Marcella fantastic. Simbrick. Look up Marcella Simbrick. Give her a listen. What a remarkable voice! Hmm. A power coloratura. Okay. She had uh, had the voice has size, but it's flexible. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just remarkable. She had, she was a huge mainstay for um, from about I think eighteen, probably ninety eight or so to or uh, maybe it was more like eighteen uh, eighteen ninety to about nineteen ten were was her period. Okay. But she she lived long enough to be recorded quite well. And okay. uh, and then there's also a very interesting. I came upon a very interesting um, interview with. You may need to edit this part because it's on the tip of my my, my mind. And um, um, Emma Eames. Mm -hmm. Emma Eames. Talking about. Uh, the nature of the recording process. And you remember the, the video of, of modern Met stars recording into a bell, right? right? Yeah. And what they would sound like? Mm -hmm. Well, she describes the process. She said, we always had, if you wonder why they sound like they're coming out the small end of a megaphone, mm -hmm. right? She said, we had to sing directly into the bell and we had to balance our, our, our top notes constantly and restrict their, their scope so as to avoid a blast. Because if you overdrive the recording needle, it just goes like this. Uh. So they constantly had to restrict their voice. She said, it, it, it's a pity, it's a pity that those of us who were prominent in the so-called golden age um, were not afforded, did not live in times of better recording technology to represent. But nevertheless, here's a selection of because the, I think one of the record clubs was was assembling a, a, some of her better known recordings, um, very famous American soprano, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so she she describes that she said that you'd have to move away or or closer depending on the volume or the right. intensity, and you constantly had to worry about the top, so you know it, that's one of the reasons why they sound like that, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes you get you just got lucky, right. You know, yeah. So it's a fascinating process, and and that that era of singing, 
uh, you have to take the recordings with a grain of salt. Be mm -hmm. And but when you get lucky with one where you go, wow, you know, I I think I can really hear that voice. Right. It's a lucky one, but they weren't slouches. No. <laughs> No. Go back to that recording of Nordica singing in Tristan, and, and it's just amazing. Yeah. And that's 1903. Okay. Yeah, so. the, the chances of them actually having worked with the composer is, goes up, too. Well, the, you, now that you when say that. about Puccini, Moscato, oh, well, yes. Leon Cavallo. Yeah. And sometimes even Wagner. Yeah. Um, Schumann Heink. Uh, I, I, no, she may not. I, I think she was there after he died. Okay. But um, there is... There's a recording that purports to be from 1882, and it's Wagner conducting Tristan at Bayreuth, hmm. about two two minutes worth. Uh, by record. However, I've also heard that there, there's a number of recordings that that somebody I saw a comment said this is a well-known fake, and not not that particular one. It said what you're listening to is a 1909 recording uh. that's been made to sound old. Huh. That's that's this right. recording. That's not who you think it is. Uh -huh. But so I wonder if somebody faked that recording of Bayreuth because the earliest that, uh, recording that I know of was the um, the recording of Israel in Egypt uh, at the Crystal Palace Festival, um, recorded very faintly in I think eighteen eighty eighty six. Okay. So, but if it, if it is actually Wagner, it, it would be extraordinary. It was. He was known to have jumped into the pit just before he died and, and, and grabbed the baton from Levi to conduct Parsifal or some, some of Parsifal right. or something like that. So anyway. Typical Wagner move. <laughs> this, yeah. What a guy. What a guy. What a guy. What a sweetheart. <laughs> it's just amazing to hear those works represented across the... You know, I, the, the earliest uh, Met recordings that I have heard are uh, of, from about live recordings, apart from the 1903 stuff, was um, the, from the radio broadcast was about 1934. Okay. It started in 31 with Hansel and Gretel. But um, and in the very first broadcast, Milton Cross was uh, basically calling the opera like a baseball game. And uh -huh. now Hansel is moving down the stage, down to stage right, and the witch is coming towards him, and they're going to, now he's going to sing the aria. And the, the, right, <laughs> nice. And people called in and said, yeah, we really like the opera, but somebody kept talking. <laughs> right. So um, they kind of got over that very quickly. Yeah. But uh, um, I kind of like that, though. I, uh, I just, it, we, we, we when you the summation of the recorded age is Luciano Pavarotti, hmm. he, you know. I mean, although um, who was it also that never learned to read music? Um, I don't know. A famous, a, 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 a very famous tenor who Toscanini took him to task for it, but uh, it didn't stop him. From, it might have been, um, might have been Caruso. I don't, I don't think Caruso ever learned to read music. I think that's who it was. Well, he's a famous boy alto. So it's, in, was... it's in the book, okay. but uh, I'm pretty sure it was Caruso. Hmm. And, um, and Pavarotti, you know, took so many cues from... Pa he's a synthesis of Caruso and Giuseppe Di Stefano mm -hmm. and, and, and Gigli. Gigli. All their best bits. All yeah. their best bits. Their turns of phrase, their approaches to notes. He's the synthesis of all this. Mm -hmm. And... Because he would just listen to recording after recording after recording absolutely. in preparation for a role. But he also had pretty exquisite taste in, find, in, in discerning which was the, health, the, the most tasteful, the healthiest, the best approach to that phrase. Hmm. And that's what made him Pavarotti. Yeah. Um, because his, his musicianship was, was scanning the gamut of recorded history right. and, 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 and learning from it. Mm-hmm. So we are blessed to live in that. We all have that cap that capacity now, right? You know, but when I my, one of my favorite recordings is uh, is a, a February of nineteen um, fifty eight Tosca with Tucker DeBaldi and Warren and Metropolis conducting, mm. and when when the volume comes up, you hear you hear the audience settling into this golden warmth, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> And you know <laughs> that it's about to be, in the middle of February in New York, it's about to be Italian summer. Yeah. And, and it is. And it's just magic. 
and to, to be able to place yourself in, in that environment through the years, um, is, it's not entirely lost. Right. Even though it's not physically present, it's, it's still sonically present. And that's a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I love going back. That, like I said, because I saw Trova, Trovatore. Trovatore. <laughs> Trovatore. <laughs> In L.A., and so while I was writing my review, I was listening to the that 47 story right. from the Met yeah. with Leonard Warren and Zinka Miller. No, Roman, what's the name, last name of the soprano? They were all really good. Though. Oh, yeah. Leonora e mm. Mia. Oh, my God. Leonora e Mia. Jumps yeah. up to the G. Yeah, he and nobody, crushed that. Leonard nobody Warren ever, was, nobody ever was like, ten, baritonered that G like Leonard Warren yeah. did. Oh my gosh. Yeah, all time. It was like an all time great moment. It's, it's stunning. Fantastic. It's just stunning. Yeah, and the sound was, was you great. You know, one, one, of the most, one, of the, one of the biggest surprises, uh, 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 whenever they mention it, one, one of the biggest surprises um, in Met repertoire was the revival of, um, of Simone Bocanegra for mm. Lawrence Tibbet. Okay. It had never been done at the Met, and they, every and everyone was really surprised at how popular it became. It beca- it's become a favorite Met opera whenever they do it. People okay. love it. And I find it to be okay. I love it, and I'll tell you why. It has an interesting shape. It starts out like this, and then it crescendos to to the denouement. Really, is the the poisoning happens in the middle of the opera, mm-hmm. and then there's a slow. Uh, tapering off into the death of, of, of the Doge and the acclamation of Gabriele Adorno as the new leader. And, and so the, this, it has this very graceful arc a, a, in its shape. It's not like most of Verdi's opera where the big finish comes at the end. Right. It's a, it's a, a real opera of process. And, 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 and I don't know, it has a real life shape to it. I, I just love it. Right. I, 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 so... Um, yeah, so the Simone Bocanegra, and that was one of that, of course, was Lauren, w- Warren's last complete role. Right. He sang just before cashing in his chips. Yeah. Now, it wouldn't have been a great if he died in Fanchula del West, then he could have said he cashed in his chips in yeah, Fanchula del West. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As it was, he succumbed to the Forza del Destino. Yes. So, um, Anyway, yeah. reflections on Good the Met. Stuff. And, and hopefully we'll see Bob Sutherland again soon, or at least t- talk to him on the, on the have, maybe have well, a three-way. I'm going to try to meet, meet with him while I'm uh, Oh, while yeah, I'm there. do it, do yeah. it. And he's, uh, it. he's working on a Wagner so- Society presentation of like Wagner performances in London and maybe the turn of this 20th century. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, would, I, I would hope to, maybe it'll be online. Maybe I can attend. Yeah. I'd love to. I'll see you there, Bob. All right. All right, for now. For now. Classical Classical Rebellion. Rebellion.